Good evening and welcome to President's Day of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. And as most of you will know, because of that, we're going to have an address from our brand new, newly minted president. I am Chris Hodge and I'm the immediate past president, so you'll know I fell from grace at about 11 o'clock this morning, but I'm still hanging on with my fingertips. And the last thing I do actually as president is this chair of this President's Day lecture by the new man. Now, Commodore Rob Dory has a very long CV and I'm going to do my best to paraphrase it into a length that gives him a chance to deliver his lecture. Uh, Commodore Rob Dory joined Trinity House as the Director of Operations in October 2015 and that carries with it uh, his role as an elder brother on the chargeable side. But in his role as Director of Operations, he is responsible for the operational functions of the Lighthouse Service delivered through the engineering, marine, commercial and planning departments. And his teams strive to deliver innovative and cost-effective solutions which maintain an effective aid to navigation service for the safety of the mariner and shipping, the prevention of pollution and facilitating trade throughout our waters. He came to Trinity House from the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, commencing his training at Warsash College of Maritime Studies as an officer cadet in 1980. He qualified as a master mariner in 1990 and was promoted to captain in 2004 and then Commodore and head of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary in 2013. During that time, he has served around the world, including conflicts in the Falklands, the Gulf, and the former Republic of Yugoslavia. He is a qualified Royal Navy Specialist Navigator and has completed staff appointments with the RFA, the Royal Navy, and in the Ministry of Defence. He gained a master's degree at the Joint Services Command and Staff College and commanded a number of ships with his last seagoing appointment conducting counter piracy operations off Somalia with embarked Royal Marine Medical and Aviation Detachments. He is a keen advocate of innovation, the application of technology and business focused personal professional development. He is a fellow of this institute and today takes office as his 116th president. The title of his talk, his address, is Light Across the Water and you'll be glad to know I've finished talking and Rob has plenty of time. Rob, the floor is yours. Well, good evening. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that, that very kind introduction. Um, that certainly saves saying anything else about me, which is always a sort of bad start, I feel, anyway. Um, but I do generally feel I've got the best job in the world. The, um, I had a fabulous career with the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, I, I came up through the RFA at a time um, during the, the start of the Falklands and then post Falklands where the integration of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary and the Royal Navy came closer and closer together and, and from a career perspective I benefited from that enormously, absolutely enormously and today I still feel that that blend of Merchant Navy training and Royal Navy training pulled together I think is, is just superb and I, I benefited from it and I'm most grateful. Um, and then I go from there into um, a day at the office, could be up a lighthouse um, or out in the ship, and, and that's just fantastic. Um, I have a view out of one office window that looks over Harwich Harbour, where my main sort of office is, and that's our operational base. And I have a little office down here that looks over Tower Hill, so you can't beat it. But you equally can't beat a day out in the lighthouse, I can assure you. Um, so um, my plan is to, is to talk you through a little bit of, of Trinity House, which is an undiscovered hotbed of innovation. And, and although the first impressions perhaps might see the gorgeous room, the chandeliers, um, behind the, the lighthouse service is just innovation through and through. And I think of a lighthouse very much as Trinity House. It's an iconic building, you know, a landmark, something that's been there for hundreds of years. But underneath the skin of a lighthouse is the latest cutting edge technology. And that's what I'll tell you about as we go through. Um, but if you'll permit me, sort of indulge me a little bit. As, as for us in London, we're, we're here in, in Trinity House and Trinity Square. Um, so I will take you through just a little bit of the structure of, of Trinity House and the organisation before I get on to the crunchy bits of keeping the lights on. And I bought one over here just as I'll explain these a little bit more. But uh, there she goes. Brilliant. Um, 
have to say, sometimes that light over there, it's a little bit like don't work with children and animals. It takes a bit of programming. Once it's up and running, they're fantastic. But, you know, in the hands of an amateur, you know, who knows. Um, so Trinity House, <coughs> we're here in this fabulous, fabulous building. Um, but the, the work of the Lighthouse Authority and the work of Trinity House is, is very separate. Um, and necessarily so, certainly in terms of funding. Although we sort of have a common aim, which is safety at sea. Um, Trinity House, this building alone is a separate charity. This has to be self-funding uh, from, from leasing the building out for events, renting it out for events, weddings, and so on. So this building has to fund itself um, through events such as, as this. Um, that's the first part. Whereas, um, if so, so if you look at, at this, just briefly at the sort of structure of Trinity House, there is the court. Sounds a little bit like a livery company, but it's a private corporation. Um, the court is the, where the elder brethren um, reside. There's 31 voting elder brethren. There are 38 because you once you won, you won for life, whether you like it or not. But there's only ever 31 uh, voting elder brethren. And they are, if you like, the senior board overseeing the operation of the whole organisation. It then splits out, as you can see there, to the lighthouse board and the corporate board. The corporate board really looks after the house and the maritime charity and the fraternity. Um, and the Lighthouse Board, um, I'll tell you more about very shortly. <clears throat> so the other part of the charity, um, the Maritime Charity as we call it, um, is uh, uh, you never see a collection box. It derives its income from some of our predecessors who made some very wise investments some hundreds of years ago and, and bought a few farms. Uh, one of those farms was just south in the river in a place now called Southwark. Um, so there's not a lot of farming goes on there, but the property there is, is very, very good, and the income from that property um, is what provides the income for the charity. And we manage to uh, routinely uh, donate about five million a year to worthy maritime causes. And that covers things like benevolence, looking after old folks at the end of, uh, towards the end of their careers. Um, and there's some arms houses we have out in Deal in Kent, but it goes to a number of other areas as well. Um, we cover maritime safety, and that can, that can be in a number of different ways. Some of the role of the Lighthouse Authority is obviously all focused on maritime safety, but it may also be, for instance, uh, funding the safety equipment on, say, Tall Ships Youth Trust or someone like that, Jubilee Sailing Trust, some an organisation that's using their vessels to take people to sea and using the sea as an environment to sort of um, change, alter and engender great behaviours amongst people, particularly, say, some young people. and. And, and some a little bit older who may have difficulties blending with society. Um, we also heavily, um, uh, we heavily fund training. Um, the bulk of that goes about a million a year to the officer cadet scheme, um, where we have currently around 100 officer cadets in our system. That's uh, engineers, deck officers, and, and electro-technical officers now. There's about 30 a year, 100 in total, um, and we fund those through a cadet scheme. We use a, a, a Chilton Marine as our agency who finds them berths on ships. So it's a fabulous way of getting great experience out of a cadet ship scheme because you're not tied to one company. So our cadets will often spend a bit of time on a can tanker, a bit of time on a bulker, a bit of time on a cruise ship, a bit of time on a row row, and they may spend a bit of time on one of our boy tenders. But they get great variety, great experience, and then we feed them out into the industry. So, so that's the primary roles of, of, of the charity. The fraternity um, is the part that feels a little like a livery company. There's, that's the younger brethren you may have heard of. There's around 400 younger brethren um, all in the maritime industry. Then we get over to the Lighthouse Board. Um, but before I tell you a little bit more about that, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about, about the general history first. Um, because we'll get into real good stuff about the Lighthouse Board. So we go back 500 years or so. 1514 was the Royal Charter from Henry VIII's day. Um, and that was really set up by a guild of mariners who, who were um, dismayed, really, by the standards of, of, um, of navigation and pilotage on the Thames. And this was all about securing trade into London. And, and the, the, um, they, they petitioned the king... Uh, for a royal charter so they could set up an organisation that would provide aids to navigation in the Thames and pilotage to help vessels come up the river and safely deliver their cargoes in and out of London. 
And that was the origins uh, of, of the organisation. They were already a charity at that point, and they ran some almshouses, so the charity sort of basis was, was already there. That went on then to um, um, get the dates right here in 1566, um, which was uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth the first Seamarks Act, um, and that allowed Trinity House to um, place beacons around the coast. So that was an expansion of the organisation. Um, so that was the start of lighthouses around the coast, really, for Trinity House. There were some existing here and there uh, a bit later on that were privately owned, um, but we took care of those later. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the legislation that let us start setting up beacons and, um, and marks. But we also, the pilotage started to spread as well. Um, and one stage we had 500 pilots servicing ports all around the UK. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more what went on with those later on as well. Um, the other part of the, the organisation, long forgotten, is ballast. And um, there is a figure that says over 300 years, fair old time has to be said, um, the, the organisation shifted 400 million tonnes of ballast. Uh, this is gravel, you know. Before ships had water ballast tanks, when their cargoes were empty, they had to put something else in. So actually digging out, dredging out ballast and selling it to ships so that they could sail again was part of the business. So we were big into the ballast business, less so nowadays, as you can imagine. Um, so we went on, and in 1609, we put out our, our first lighthouse off of Lowestoft. And this was really to um, support the coal trade that was going up and down the East Coast. Um, as many as you will appreciate, the, the East Coast in particular, there's lots of shallow water, moving sandbanks. It's all on the move, still is, I and mean, it's still an important part of our role today. Um, so um, a lighthouse was, uh, was positioned there, and vessels were charged fourpence every time they passed the lighthouse. And, and that was the early stages of light dues, which is the way we're funded today. We're funded by the, uh, the government, puts in place uh, a system of light dues as they see it, the user pays. So when ship owners come into port, they pay a proportion of, of money based on their tonnage, 37.5p a net tonne at the moment, uh, which goes to light dues, and that goes into a big fund run by the Department of Transport, and we draw down upon that fund to fund our lighthouse activities. And you can see why that's very important, that that funding is very separate to the charity. So it's very clear what the ship owners are getting for their money. Um, and they don't pay for the house. You'd hate to also, from our other sort of charitable objectives, why do we split the house from the rest? Well, I think it would be important that we're not having a discussion about do we clean the chandeliers or do we look after some old chap on hard times. So the, all the charity split and the lighthouse split of funding is, is very clear in there for a reason. So let's get into the lighthouse authority. This is where the nitty gritty is. Uh, this is my day job. Um, and uh, and, and it, it, I do just absolutely love it. So why are we there? Why are we there? Figures that are banded around, you know these sort of things. 95% of trade moves by sea. Um, what we're there for really is to facilitate the safe movement of trade. Clearly it's the safety of the mariner as well. But why is the mariner there primarily for trade? You can accept today leisure as well. So there are a range of uses of, this, of the sea, but primarily it's, it's trade. Um, and that's what we're there for. We're given our responsibility under the Merchant Shipping Acts. So our role is to determine what aids to navigation are required and then to provide them. And then we provide them to an IALA, International Association of Lighthouse Authorities, standard. So all our aids to navigation, things like that light there, have to perform to 99.8% availability. That's the IALA standard. So it's a pretty tough, tough ask particularly the environment that we put them in, as you would appreciate. Um, this is something that you clearly don't really need to be told. These are AIS tracks. Um, these are AIS tracks around the UK there. Um, that's 28 days around the UK, and it's one day in the Dover Straits. And my point of this is just, you know it, it's busy. It's busy, shipping is increasing, the size of shipping is increasing, the density, if you like, of shipping in an area is increasing. It's a busy part of the world. The Dover Strait, as you know, is a particularly busy place. The Dover Strait is not only the route to the UK uh, and our east coast, it's also the route, of course, to the major European ports, Antwerp, Hamburg, Rotterdam, and so on, as well as for Felixstowe and the Humber for us. So it's a significant point. Um, 
And of course, it leads into the Southern North Sea, as I've mentioned, with those shallow waters, moving sandbanks. It's an area that is constantly on the move. And 30 metres is not deep water in today's world. Um, but people say, but everyone's got electronics now, haven't they? It's not really sort of, you know, it's an old hat, isn't it? This sort of thing. Well, there's a couple of points to that. Uh, one, this is, this is uh, a little chart that shows you the fitting or the requirement, carriage requirements, as they call it, for electronic chart systems in ships. And we've just got to 2018. In 2018, um, uh, all existing vessels, we're at sort of at the end of that, that row of implementation, Existing vessels, cargo vessels of over 10,000 tonnes now have to carry ECTIS. So we've gone through a whole process of, quite often, the sort of implementation comes in with new vessels, passenger vessels and so on, tankers, higher risk vessels, and then ends up with cargo vessels. There's an awful lot of current vessels less than 10,000 tonnes. About 80% of the UK register is less than 10,000 tonnes. So the carriage of electronic chart systems such as this are not mandated for an awful lot of vessels. But even where they are, even where they are, the need for visual aids is still necessary. I'll talk a little bit later about satellite navigation and vulnerabilities. But actually, what we're seeing, and we monitor traffic, we monitor traffic flows, and I'll tell you a bit more about some of our pilots, because although pilots went away, um, because they're now run by the individual ports, we still license deep sea pilots. And they're a fabulous source of information to us. So we don't have to rely on the likes of me saying when I was at sea, we get genuine live feedback from our deep sea pilots every day who tell us what ships are doing and tell us how our aids and navigation are helping and what the mariner needs. So they're really useful to us. But what we're seeing is that with the wonderful age of electronics, we're seeing the safety margins start to be eroded. We're seeing people cutting the corners in simple terms, much closer than they might have done before. We're looking at um, vessels overtaking each other much closer than they did before. And, and a whole host of things, people perhaps not looking out the window as much as they did before. But the thing that will keep them out of trouble, the last thing that they will see is the lighthouse, is the buoy, which is, is what will keep them safe. When there's a wreck or a new danger, that buoy that we will place will keep them safe. And I'll talk a bit more about wrecks and things. It's a really important factor. So, some of the roles. Here we go. Brilliant. Um, so, we're into boys, we're into lighthouses, differential GPS stations, um, and at the bottom left there, wrecks. And I'll tell you a bit more about wrecks as we go on. But um, 66 lighthouses, um, 447 boys, um, and a lot of those do more than just mark the place of danger or shallow water. They communicate with us as well. They may have AIS, they may have uh, Raycon, um, and they may be such that we communicate with them back to our centre in Harwich. Um, differential GPS stations. We run the seven differential GPS stations in our areas. I should have mentioned Trinity House responsible for the waters around England, Wales, the Channel Islands, and Gibraltar. Um, we have a sister organisation, the Northern Lighthouse Board, who looks after Scotland and the Isle of Man. And we work very closely with the commissioners of Irish Lights, who are based in the Republic of Ireland. And they look after Ireland, but they also look after Northern Ireland uh, on, under sort of contract, if you like, from the Department of Transport. So we work very closely together. Um, and, and of course, we do interact. Those borders are not cast in stone. We work and help each other when we have ships in dock and so on. So we work very closely together. And we exchange a lot of information. And we exchange a lot of technology and development of technology as we go. We also have 10 light vessels. They're predominantly around the sort of southeast coast. Big visual landmarks, big visual landmarks, big visual uh, marks um, in, in key strategic places where that visual impact is needed much more than just a boy alone. And how do we look after them? Well, I have a range of tools at my disposal. There's, there's roughly 300 people in the Lighthouse Authority side of Trinity House. Um, in, in rough numbers, that's about 100 mariners. It's about 100 engineers, and that's everyone, civil engineering, mechanical, electrical, design engineers, and so on. And a research department that really does some of this cutting edge technology innovation, which I'll show you a little bit <coughs> down here later on. Um, then there's the, the other sort of third, if you like, is predominantly made up of of the support services, IT, HR, 
uh, procurement, and so on. So that's our sort of numbers. So I have the ships. We've got four ships, three that, um, that we operate and one that's under charter. Um, helicopter, which we share across the three lighthouse authorities. That's a joint contract with Scotland and Ireland. Um, but it can equally, and I make this point, it took me ages to get this photograph in the bottom there, because I kept saying to people, you know, the ship is a tool of the trade. You know, that's how I get my engineers to put the thing in the right place in the first place and to service it when it goes wrong. You know, these are all tools of the trade, and it could equally be a man in a helicopter to some of our offshore stations, or it could be a man in a van, as you see in the bottom, you know, the AA of the Lighthouse Authority. Um, but Rex, I'll just touch on Rex down there. Um, that's our smaller ship, the Alert. She's often um, stationed primarily around the sort of southeast corner uh, of the UK, uh, our rapid intervention vessel. We split the, the waters into response areas, and the Dover Straits stretch in sort of about west to Eastbourne pretty much, and north um, up, um, up to the Wash um, is our six-hour response area. That means we have to have a vessel on station in six hours. That's not sailing in six hours, that's there and capable of doing the job, capable of delivering the task. Um, other areas we have around the Humber, Solent and Land's End are 12-hour areas and the rest of the UK for us is predominantly 24-hour areas, the rest of our waters. So we have a sort of measured response area. All our ships, if they're in port, they're at an hour's notice to sail. If they're not in dry dock, they're at an hour's notice to sail or they're at sea. And that's it. I'd expect availability 345 days a year, averaged over three years. The rest is planned maintenance time, effectively, the other, the other bit. Um, so, so, Rex, what's the big deal? Well, the trickler in 2002 was, was part of, not exclusively, was part of the reason for, for the purchase of Alert. Um, the trickler, um, as you can see, is laying on the bottom there. The beam is just about the depth of water. Um, she was in the, um, the, um, the approaches, um, well, she was on the French side, actually, of the waters, um, but was in that sort of Davis Straits area. Um, an exclusion zone was put around that vessel and a hundred ships went through it and three hit it. The, it took in the end has six guard vessels to be permanently stationed there to warn shipping away from the wreck. Our worry about this sort of thing is we're not necessarily, we, we place our aids to navigation to facilitate safe navigation, but in this role once safety of life is taken care of, which clearly we would assist him but is not our primary role, our role is to mark that wreck, to make the area safe for the mariners who follow. We're trying to avoid, if you like, we sometimes refer to it in the channel as the motorway pileup of significant vessels, big tonnage vessels, having a pileup which could ultimately, you know, block some key areas of the Dover Straits. But our role here is to make the place safe for other mariners who follow. Now, not all our wrecks are as obvious as that one. You'd like to think we would have spotted that and put some boys around it. And, and we certainly did. But um, these, these things, I'll talk more wrecks as we go. It's really important that we react quickly and get there to stop that pileup. This is a little area of the, the Dover Straits, and the circle is around the, the entrance to the Sandetti deep water route. All vessels over 16 metres draft are advised to follow that route and, frankly, need to follow that route. It's about seven cables across, about three quarters of a mile across. There's some sand waves that block about two, two cables of that if you're a deep draft vessel, particularly deep draft vessel. So you're left with about half a mile. And ships are frequently passing each other there at very close quarters. If you block this area, it's like shutting off a bit of the M25. It really is. This, this, that point is the, the, the choke point, really, for deep draft traffic through to Europe. It's really significant. And things happen. This was the 1st of July, collision between um, a 50,000 ton um, tanker and a bulk carrier. Um, she, on, the, on this is just, um, just off of the, oh, that's right, let me get the next slide up. This is, just, um, this is just off the falls for anyone familiar with that, but it's just as you come down towards the Dover Straits, it's starting to funnel in very tight here. These are the tracks of, of one vessel coming down that southwest lane, the other one merging slightly from the north, and they, they collided in that southwest lane. They then strayed across, while they were sort of locked together, into the northeast lane, 
almost exactly at the point that I just highlighted, that little circle in the Sandetti deep water route. If one of them had sunk there, that would have been a significant hazard to other shipping, a very significant hazard to other shipping. <coughs> Luckily, they didn't. They were damaged. One limped away, and then they both limped away with a so The other one went, limped away with, with tug assistance. Um, but these do happen. Um, the Fluvius Tamar, this was in January uh, 17, 14th of January, I think, rings a bell. Um, this was a 90 metre single, um, single hold uh, little bulker, about 3,000 tonnes, um, sank in, in poor weather in the southwest lane. If you go about 50 miles off of, off of uh, Ramsgate, that's the sort of point you're thinking of. Um, so this vessel went down, all the people got off. Um, and were saved, which is superb. So the first thing we've got to do, here's an example. This isn't something sticking out the water. This is not something we can see. So the first job is to get there and find the wreck. So all of our ships have got to have good survey kit and people that can use it. The skills of our people, like in so many places, are so important. It's not just having the equipment. You've got to have the skills of the people. They've got to be trained. They've got to be used to it. They've got to be familiar with the kit. Because I need clear results from this. Their mission is to find that wreck, because they're not often where they thought they were. I'll show you another example shortly. Um, this one wasn't too far out, luckily. It was in about 30 metres of water. Um, so their next job is to ascertain the clearance depth. What's the clearance above that? How much of a hazard does that represent? Okay. Um, it was determined that this, the masts left about 15 metres clearance. But we're in a lane with 22 metre draft vessels going through there very frequently. So it's a clear hazard to any shipping in that area. So we get out there, as I say, we find it, we locate it, ascertain the clearance depth, we mark it. We mark it, we send out um, uh, maritime safety information, you know, notice to mariners, radio navigation warning. Um, that has to go out. We talk to the hydrogra UK Hydrographic Office, who would then relay that out onto the system. Um, and we also monitor that to make sure that it's what we said it was, but also because it also gives us clues as to what else is going on in the world. So we do monitor nav techs all the time um, back at our headquarters. Um, so we're now out there, we're marking that wreck, but we stay there because of the importance of that and the amount of traffic coming down there, we left the ship there as a guard ship to warn other vessels away. So the boys will be set in a pattern of four. There'll be a rake on the boys, so it shows up on the radar as well, and we kept the ship there to warn vessels away. Okay. Um, we were there for about a week, at which point then the owners um, uh, contracted another you know, commercial vessel to take over that role so that we could stand down and, and monitor the situation. Um, there was a point, in fact, where a hurricane... Doris, I think, blew through, where the chartered vessel had to pull off and we had to send one of ours back. So uh, one of our larger ones, it has to be said. So a really important role, that ship was then later salvaged, and that's the bottom uh, right picture there, is the, the ship being lifted between two barges. So these things do happen. Another little one. Um, this was a little ship... Uh, sorry, that's the end of that one. Sorry, here's another little one. This is the tug called the Ella that, that sank on the 7th of July last year, just off Lowestoft. Um, relatively small, yeah, not big, but in relatively shallow water. So again, a little ship in very deep water, maybe not much of an issue. But a little ship, even something this size, in relatively shallow water on the approaches to Lowestoft, as this was, it's a significant hazard once again. So this needed to be lifted. Um, the wreck, convention. Um, the wreck convention says vessels over 300 tonnes have to be insured for salvage. Uh, this was less than 300 tonnes and it wasn't insured. So the General Lighthouse Fund had to pick up the bill for this. This was an unusual one, but it's all part of our remit that the requirement to move that wreck was then given by the Department of Transport, SOSREP, Secretary of State's representative you might hear of. That, that task was then given. We told them where it was. It was 1.9 miles away from where they said it was. So it took a bit of hunting, um, and actually where it was was more of a hazard than, than it might have been. So, so we determined it had to be shifted. That job then came to us to actually take charge of the salvage. Now, we don't salvage it. We contract in a salvage expert who then lifted that vessel, and you can see her there. It was a tug that someone had bought for something like a pound and was uh, converting it into a restaurant, um, and it was being towed, and it sank. And when you saw the state of the hull, particularly around the CERN, you can see 
why it did and why it should never have gone to sea. So wrecks. Let's get on to lighthouses. So Ediston. Ediston Light, often referred to as one of our uh, most iconic, one of our most famous um, lighthouses uh, off of Plymouth. And in my RFA days, I spent what seemed like an eternity going round and round uh, Ediston Rock. <laughs> um, but all good fun in hindsight. The, um, so Ediston. Um, there's been four Ediston, Edistons, actually. The first one, which was the, the nice, rather pretty one, the top left, was built by a chap um, called uh, Henry Wynne Stanley in 1698. He was a, a musical instrument maker, hence it looked really rather attractive. It was made out of wood. Um, it was wonderful. Looked great. Um, uh, it fell down. The, uh, destroyed by a storm in 1703. Um, but there was a point during that time where uh, he was uh, Wynne Stanley, the poor chap, was actually kidnapped by the French. He was whipped off of his lighthouse, kidnapped. Um, but when he got back to France, they realised that he was a chap that built the lighthouses, thought he was a cracking bloke, and sent him back again. So that was really good of him. <laughs> so, uh, lucky guy, but his, but his lighthouse fell down anyway. Um, so, um, the, one on the, uh, the one to the right there um, uh, was the one built by, let me just check who did that one. Um, that's Smeaton, Smeaton's Tower, that one. Um, actually, cracking, cracking tower but cracking being the problem because of the rocks underneath. Um, but you can see the sort of iconic shape, the way that was coming together. Um, and that sort of, you know, formed the, the basis of, of lighthouses into that, into that, from that era onwards. Um, that was uh, 1759. Um, but the rocks underneath started to crack. So they had to give up on that lighthouse, hence they started building the one to the left, which was in, in progress uh, at the time, which was built by chap James Douglas in 1882. Um, fascinating though, the, um, the original Smeaton's Tower, that's the base of it, and that's it still today. The, the condition of the pointing on those bricks, 150 odd years on, is just outstanding. <laughs> so there was something, of, without a doubt, something about the quality of the build, you know, um, and I'll, I'll explain some of the log logistics issues we have today. But doing that in that location with that quality of build is amazing. And you can see some of the blocks on the top, how these aren't just square blocks. These are all interlocking. You know, it was clever stuff. It really was. Innovation of its day, without a doubt. Um, but um, accessibility is one of our issues. You know, I often say to people, actually, the logistics for us of doing a job is a bigger part of it as the job itself, often bigger. You know, this, this one here is, is Lundy North in the Bristol Channel. You know, it's a fair hike down there. You have to get a ferry across to Lundy in the first place. Um, we do use a helicopter occasionally for some, some kit, but the helicopter's not great on lots of weight. Um, it's about three miles from one end to the other. You can take a Land Rover some of the way, uh, and then you walk the rest. Um, it really is a sort of logistic task. This is one that's on our sort of register. It's in the early stages of planning. Um, we'll, be, we'll be sort of doing some serious work down there in a couple of years' time. And it takes a lot of planning um, to get everything in place and to do the job. We've just finished a cracking job on um, Sark Lighthouse. Um, and it's, I'll explain a little bit more about what we actually do. But again, this is a, a lighthouse sort of nestling on the edge of a cliff on an island that doesn't even operate vehicles. You know, you normally, if you go there as a tourist, you get a donkey. Um, there are some tractors around. If you have a farm, you're allowed a tractor there. So we did get a bit of kit put in. Um, but because they don't even have vehicles, they don't, they don't look friend, uh, too, too keenly on helicopters either. But we did have to get special permission to finally operate the helicopter, which we used to shift all our kit from our ship onto the, onto the lighthouse to do that work and then shift all the old kit out later on. Um, some of the, that, that logistics... Um, I'll talk a bit about mercury, but effectively we were extracting mercury that, from, from that area. So we had to shift airlift mercury and then import it to the UK. Um, so importing hazardous waste has a cracking sort of uh, set of paperwork to go with it, you can imagine. Um, some of our offshore stations, you know, um, they, take some, they take some logistics trying to work out how you do those. Some of these you can only land on the roof by helicopter. So to get all your kit on or the people on, you know, it's a hell of a task. And of course, there's maintenance to do. So our engineers will go out there and spend 10 days living on a lighthouse. 
um, working through the sort of planned maintenance. We tend to visit the lighthouse twice a year, that's all. Um, but they'll, be, they'll live there for those sort of 10 days or so. That's the inside of uh, Wolf Rock. Um, you can see the curves, you can see the bunks, um, the kitchen. And one of our big issues is damp. It was great when people, people were there permanently, um, but now they're not. So, you know, when they were warm and ventilated, super. Now actually controlling the damp and the condition of the building is one of our biggest, biggest sort of obstacles to keep the structure of the building. This is before we even start talking about how the light flashes. Um, so they do go out there. Um, I actually ended up with a team that were only due to be out for a couple of days and they got stuck on Bishop's Rock over last weekend. So you always take a spare Mars bar and a pack of sandwiches because you can never really be sure. We got them off on Monday. They were still smiling there. Well, that's what they told me. But, um, Nab Tower, another iconic sort of one just east of the Isle of Wight. Um, this was refurbished back in 2012. Um, Nab Tower was originally going to be part of 12 structures built as a sort of anti-submarine sort of defences. Um, in the end, only um, I think there were one was built, this one, and one was partially constructed, which was taken apart. Um, you could see, you know, huge scope for corrosion, steelwork sort of falling apart, rust everywhere, not, not pretty. So that was a fairly major job, and there she is today. She's a little bit shorter. Um, she's a lot tidier, all the steelwork removed, fresh cement coating applied, um, modern coatings, modern sort of, you know, two-pack epoxy coatings and so on um, to preserve that for the future. And we'd normally do a preservation of, when we do a thorough refurbishment of lighthouse, we're looking for a 20 years life out of it as a minimum. Um, I mentioned earlier, of course, these guys, the old lighthouse keepers are gone. So that was 1998, the last lighthouse keeper left North Foreland. Um, that was progressive sort of automation through the lighthouses. So clearly reduced manpower significantly as automation became an option. Really. So all our lighthouses are automated and uh, they're all monitored in our, our, our center in Harwich, uh, where we keep an eye on all of our lighthouses. We, all, of, all of our significant boys, which have communications, now light vessels have communications, not every boy, but the major, major bigger ones. Um, we also, out of hours, monitor the, 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 the uh, aids to navigation for the Northern Lighthouse Board and for Irish Lights as well. So all done from, from Harwich there. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of sort of radio navigation warnings, they're not only monitoring our equipment, and that includes things like not just is the light on or off, that includes the sort of battery state and so on, so we can, the engineers can interrogate those, those, uh, uh, those stations and see that they're good, or if they're starting to deteriorate, we can start to take some preemptive action. So it's not wait for a failure. We can start looking at these things and monitor uh, trends and so on. Um, but they're also monitoring there for wrecks, new dangers, alerts from the Coast Guard, anything that's going on that might trigger us into a need to react. Okay. So then we get into lights themselves. Uh, these are just magic. The, the Fresnel lens is just a work of art. It's sort of science and art that comes together in my view. And, and of course they were incredibly effective. And they're in many ways, the, the, the lenses are still difficult to beat. They're, they're absolutely phenomenal. And of course the lens, the power you get from a light is not just about the light, it's the combination of the light and the lens. The light source and the lens together give you that, that range. And of course the, 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 um, the, lamp, the lamp there, um, one of the older ones, some of these were three kilowatt lamps. You know, it's a three bar heater sitting there, I mean, giving you that light you need in the early days. And of course we gradually progressed um, through different types of lamps to, to get to the LEDs um, that, we, that we have today. Um, but the optics are great, but the other part of them, as I mentioned earlier, is they float on a bed of mercury. So you're gonna have about 20 gallons of mercury in there, um, in this sort of, imagine a sort of circular bath that these things rotate on. And they're fantastic. You push them with one finger and they rotate. They have two little electric motors that run constantly, and they just, so if one fails, the other keeps going and they just gradually turn. There's no weight, there's no pressure, they're a dream. But they're a hazard. We want to get rid of mercury. If we had an incident and that ended up in the sea, it's in particularly bad news. We do have to clean mercury. When we, sometimes you might get a report that says, you know, the, the characteristic isn't correct. The, and what that might be is a slowing down of the rotation because the mercury is getting muck in it and it starts to sort of get that resistance. So at the moment, 
where we have mercury from time to time, our guys are fully trained, have all the kit, but it's, they, they will then take the mercury out, they will filter it, clean it and put it back. But you can imagine that's a job that I'm not that keen on doing more often than I have to. Um, so if we can get rid of mercury, we will, and that is our aim, to slowly remove the mercury. But that does mean removing these fabulous rotating optics. There has been work going on by our research department looking at bearings, um, but they haven't yet come up with a bearing that is reliable enough and maintenance-free enough for us to, to, use, <coughs> for, to use in this application. So, but we, um, but we do have alternatives, so good things are coming, good things are coming. Um, Longstone, Longstone, um, lovely lighthouse, Grace Darling Territory. Um, although they are an ally claimer, she was actually a, um, a, li light, um, a lighthouse keeper's daughter. So, you know, we'll keep that in mind. Um, so, wonderful place. Um, and the optic there was a very unusual one, this spectacle optic, which was their attempt in its day to provide some redundancy so that if one failed you've still got the other they rotated together on a single bed so if one failed you've got the second back up and that's not not true in most places that have a rotating optic various things have been designed over the years to have um, as they've gone away from the big lamps which would have been changed by the lighthouse keeper um, they've gone to, we've, we've got designs of things that automatically change a lamp when one fails, it will rotate round and bring another, another lamp into place. Um, but they all have their limitations. Um, this is, um, and I'll show you what's behind those optics nowadays, but you can also see their um, solar panels on the roof. And this is part of our quest really, the combination of solar technology, battery technology and LED lights has transformed our business absolutely transformed our business and in today's world and I'll show, there are LEDs behind those optics so we've kept those at the moment um, and have LEDs behind them something like this one on the table that I'll show you but we've got solar power because the solar power through batteries can charge uh, can keep that LED running because the power demand of the, the LED is so much less the really astute um, um, solar panel distributor will tell us that of course what you got them laying down for you want them at about 36 degrees to get the best angle on the sun um, but this is one of our other constraints a lot of our places are listed buildings they're on sites of special scientific interest we weren't allowed to have solar panels that projected above the roof line so they had to be at 12 degrees so they didn't project above the roof to comply with the planning constraints which meant of course we needed more than we would have had otherwise, but there's only so much space there, which means we actually have had to keep a generator, an automated generator, which will come online, particularly in the winter months, if we don't get enough sunlight to keep the batteries charged. So we're still in a position where we have a generator and therefore we have a diesel supply, but our diesel demand is reduced considerably, but we would rather be in a position where we have no diesel there at all, because where you've got it, you've got to replenish it. Every time you replenish it, you've got a risk. So we'd rather not, um, in our ideal lighthouses, we won't have diesel, we won't have mercury, and I'll show you them a bit later on. But as you go into lights, as I mentioned, sort of lights have changed a lot over the years. This is our sort of quest as you go through different types. So we're after something with good life, but we also need plenty of lumens for the watt. We need plenty of light output for electrical input. Um, so you can see in a traditional filament lamp, 2,000 hours life, you know, 16 lumens per watt, not great. Um, and you go on through, tungsten halogen, good life, still not that powerful. So places where we have used halogens in, in place of the old lamps, we often have a cluster. Um, metal halide, they're pretty good. Now we're up to sort of 20,000 life um, and, and, and good, um, good output, but you can't flash it. So that sort of lamp is all right if you've got a rotating optic, which provides your flash, but it's no good to you in one where you just need the lamp to flash on its own. And there's many of them like that. Places that have a sector light, a sector is difficult to create with a rotation. So you'd have a fixed lens and maybe a red section and you need the light to flash itself. You need the lamp to flash and give you that sector. So great in some applications, but not perfect. And you can see where we get to you know, LEDs. Now we're up to sort of theoretically 100,000 hours and 100 lumens a watt. Not quite as good as your metal halide, 
But hey, you can flash it, you can leave it running, you can do a lot of things with it. So it, it really is fantastic. So, demo time. Uh, okay, this, this is a, an LED light that has been, um, I need the mic, sorry. I have to remember. So this is an LED light that's been developed by our own in-house research and radio navigation department who work for all the lighthouse authorities, not just for Trinity House. So we spread, spread the good news. Um, this has been developed, and you can see in the center here, very small, but there's little stacks of LEDs there. And, and these are the heat sinks, because contrary to popular belief, they get hot. Um, not in the traditional sense, but you need to move, move the heat away from these to keep them effective. Okay. Um, so, there we are. Um, very low power. That at the moment is drawing 0 0.03 of an amp. And I can take it to a point where you shouldn't look at it. But just to sort of crank it up a little, you'll see just out of the corner of your eye, perhaps, how far that goes. I'm up to a quarter of an amp. <laughs> OK. And I could take this one up to six amps. So I'll take it down again. But they are fantastic devices. This one's developed in-house, as I mentioned, but that technology is now available on the open market, and a number of the ones we fit now are just straight off the shelf by the suppliers. But these have a particular use in where we still have an optic. We can put this into it, um, and it's very, very effective. Um, our latest version of this... Move back, if I may. Our, our, latest, our latest version of, of that sort of light operates with 36 of those LEDs. And in, in a recent test at a station, a live station, um, we achieved a 21 miles range of that light, drawing 108 watts. That was, that was in a rotating optic, where you get great focus of the light through the lens. Okay? In a static optic, you need more power because it's not focused in the same way. So in a static optic, you need more power. But I can do that with one of these because I can flash them or I can leave them on like they are today. So in a static optic, cranked up to 270 watts, we achieved 19 miles range in a static um, optic. They are superb and the technology is just getting better and better. At the same time, the amount of solar energy you can collect from per square meter is improving all the time. We have a standard panel that fits to some of our, our boys, um, which used to be 50 watts and is now 75. It's getting better and better. I'll move on a bit. Um, the other problem that, um, that I'm, uh, uh, me and my engineering team deal with, of course, is, is when the requirements area, and we keep the requirements and delivery very separate, so it's nice and pure, that some, one group is focusing purely on what the mariner needs and is not influenced by cost, and then comes to my department, who we then have to come up with the engineering solution to deliver that. Now, one of our issues here is if I want a mile, I can use sort of one, one candela. Well, that's the theory. One candela gives me a nautical mile. Okay? But if I want five miles out of a light, I need 100 candela. Yeah, if I need 10 miles, I need 1,000. Yeah, if I need 20 miles, I need 100,000, and so on. A million will get me to 26 miles, which is about our longest range light. So the power required is exponential in relation to the range of the light. So again, the improvements in technology of lights that can keep that power demand down and solar energy that can keep that power generation up is what makes us successful. I'll scoot on. Here's, here's the, this sort of light um, in a fixed optic, and you can see the red sector there. Um, that's how we would deliver that. These are particularly good because the light is very, very, the light itself, the light source is quite focused. Okay, and that gives us a good sort of um, cut off in angle against those, those sectors. Um, but even there, it's quite interesting because well, you think a lot of these light, these, these lenses were built around gas lamps where they used to burn acetylene. 
So you can imagine the acetylene sort of bulb that is of a certain volume, like a golf ball. And the lens, of course, is designed to be maximised against that sort of size of lamp. So we have a bit of a conundrum where to get good power out of a light, we need it fairly tight. If you spread those out, you sort of lose the overall effect. But we need it a certain size to be optimised against the design of the lens. So we, 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 and that's why our research department works really hard to try and match the lens to the light source. You can't just stick any old bulb in it. Although if you want a bulb, you go to a garden centre, I'm told. But So you can't stick any old lamp in it. So, um, and if you think back to some of those big three kilowatt lamps, you know, you look at the spacing of the filaments, they were trying to replicate the old gas, size of the gas bulb. So there's a few more of these. Um, I'll just touch briefly, of course, it's not just about the light, it's about visual conspicuity as well. You've got to remember, there's a lot of daylight out there, as people say, and you still need to be able to see your lighthouse. So when you go and look up your Admiralty list of lights, you'll find a description of each lighthouse so the mariner knows what he's looking for. But, you know, painting is an important part of our job. Probably cost about 30000 to paint a lighthouse, you know, but it's important that they're visible, both in daytime and nighttime. A few other little basic things in here. As mentioned, just, just things like general husbandry and cleanliness of the lighthouse. So although we now don't have lighthouse keepers, we still have a local attendant who will go in there every couple of months and, and give it a clean. Because the dirt build up on the lens will significantly affect the, the uh, range of the light. Um, Europa Point, Gibraltar. Um, Unfortunate incident there with the wreck right up against the rock, but Gibraltar is, is, um, is one of the ones we've recently uh, modified. Uh, and if we look at some light sources there, the one on the far right is now the Gibraltar light. So we've gone from what might have been on the left there, a lens um, with, with a, a halogen lights there in a little cluster and can rotate round, to the one on the far right now, which is twin, off-the-shelf, commercially available LEDs. Each of those gives 18 miles range and they're doubled up so we have redundancy, we have duplicate power supplies, um, duplicate battery banks, so that we can have absolute redundancy and, and maintain the service to the mariner should one of those fail. Okay. My sort of perfect example I mentioned that I'd sort of get to there, Bardsey Island, gorgeous place, absolutely beautiful off of Anglesey. And this, really, this, is, this is really totally independent. We've got a space for a good solar array and we've got LED lights. This is an unusual one, this is red. You need more power to create a red light for the same range as than you would for a white light. So you can see these are doubled, doubled if you see what I mean. So the two reds give that same sort of range as the single red, a single white would have done. And, but they're duplicated, so if one lot fails, we've got a second supply. That's a really neat setup, Bardsey. Boys, oh, a night out with the boys, you can't beat it. More to these than meets the eye, though. What we're looking at, the one on the left there, is one of our Type 1 boys, um, which is tall to give a high focal plane to give the range of a light. So that could be up to a nine-mile light. Clearly, it's no point having a powerful light if it's down here. So you need a certain height. Now, to get that certain height, you also need a certain stability. This is one of a, a light off of some of the other more standard, smaller boys. This would be either programmed as a three or five mile. You can see we get an angle here. This is 10 degrees. Okay? So you allow 10 degrees to allow the boy to move to a certain extent. This will be one and a half degrees in a fixed shore station. So all of that uses power. If I want more power, more angle, I have to put more power in. You know, nothing, nothing comes free. So, um, but how do I keep a big tall boy stable? Well, that big one, as we call a class one, has what we call a tail tube on the bottom. So the hull, which, which is in, sunk into, the, into a recess in the ship's hull there. So altogether, that's about 12 metres in height, weighs about 15 tonnes, and that tail tube keeps the whole thing, the whole structure, uh, steady. That will also probably have a Raycon on it, it will have AIS on it, um, it will have uh, communications to tell us if it's out of position, um, and the state of the batteries and the operation of the light and so on. That structure gives us great coverage. We've got huge surface area there for solar panels. Whereas some of the smaller wreck marker boy, this one here, 
that rec marker bore, you can see that's an old design and, and really doesn't have much space for, um, for solar power. And, and like a lot of the small ones, it would be something like this. We call that a Toblerone, but it's something like that. So as we're looking at buoy design, we're looking at buoy designs that are newer that can create more surface area to put more solar on board, create more energy. So the challenge I give to the engineers is, I don't want you to come to me telling me power's a limitation. Now there's a big ask, but that's the ask. That's what we're driving for. I, I want to keep buoys in the water for 10 years. We normally keep them in for six years. I want to get it out to 10. So it's all about paint coatings. Will they last? Will they keep their color? You know, so they th those things are improving. The lugs on the bottom, where the chains connect, where over time. So how can we make them last longer? Actually, we've got a simple solution for that. You double up the number of lugs, and then the ship, when it inspects the buoy, can just swap the chains around on the lugs. That means you don't have to bring the buoy back. Um, but what I want these boys to be able to do is to be set for the future. I want these to be able to take third-party equipment. We're doing some tests at the moment with Met Office where we've got Met Gear on a, a buoy in the Bristol Channel on one of the Thames Estuary, where we've got their Met Office equipment, which is relaying live weather data to shore. We would never have had the power to do that before. We do that from light vessels, but we've never done it from buoys before. But now, as technology improves all the time, we can do that. So what will the future, what will the future be? Well, e-navigation, some may be aware. Looking at sort of greater, in amongst e-navigation, which requires positioning, uh, navigation timing. It's also a lot about communications. Almost a, an uninterrupted information flow between ship and shore. Could carry all sorts of data, whether it's people, whether it's cargoes, whether it's destinations, route planning. That's being developed at the moment. Um, why? Well, this is part of it. Um, how does that... This is a Navtex that will give you a navigation warning. And there's one there that says six containers reported adrift. How does that get onto your electronic chart? There's an air gap. Yeah, so it requires a lot of manual input. It would be really good in the future if there was no air gap and it would appear on the chart. So that communication flow, that might be just one application. That communications will need to improve. So the idea is, is VHF data exchange system. This is being developed at the moment um, that will, will facilitate this transfer of data. I believe that in that bit between ship and shore could be a buoy. Our network, think of our buoys as a network of communication nodes, transmitting data all over the place. It's very possible, and with the right power available, it's something we could do. So I want us to be future-proofed, ready to sort of embrace that as that sort of need for data comes along. Just briefly, I mentioned GPS and uh, global navigation satellite systems and their vulnerabilities. Another reason to keep the, the need for visual conventional aids. But these, there are problems with um, GPS. We're very dependent upon it. That little sort of thing on the right there just shows you how many feeds. That's just on a ship. How many feeds sort of come off of a GPS system? How many systems are dependent? And yet we know they're subject to solar flares, flares and, inst and uh, interference. And you can now buy a little jammer off of eBay and jam them locally. So they're not, um, they're not good at everything. And it's not just maritime. This is communications, digital broadcasting, banking, so many things, quite often not necessarily the position, but the timing signal is really important. And there's choices, aren't there? Different nations producing these different sort of satellite systems. Well, they are. but. Our argument is that really is a system, all your eggs are in one basket. They may be different systems, but they're all subject to the same interference, the same potential jamming, and so on. So there needs to be an alternative, we believe. There needs to be an alternative land-based, terrestrial-based navigation system that can substitute for a, a global um, um, satellite systems. And all these ideas are under, uh, in, uh, just under development. ELARAM was a system that was, was developed, but other countries are pulled away from that at the moment. But that said, South Korea has, has an ELARAM system. America is looking at it again. Um, South Korea gets GPS jamming quite frequently, so you can see why they, they feel the need. But there is more recognition. Recent government produces papers, government produced papers are now highlighting 
the vulnerability to being dependent upon uh, GPS and other satellite-based systems. So our research area is looking into some of these alternatives. And this is in international collaboration through IALA. So R mode is one way of using our differential GPS beacons, perhaps to provide a range-in type system. Um, absolute radar positioning. This could take a couple of forms. This could take the form of beacons that, that transmit a, a, a signal which you can then turn into, turn into a distance and triangulate. But it could also be against mapping, mapping of actual, actual mapping against predicted mapping um, of, of the land to give you a position. Um, very much development, um, not proven in many ways, but the potential is there. But of course, you've got to look at how far offshore, where does that run out, you know, and so on. There's lots of reasons why these, these may not be the answer, but there needs to be an answer, we believe. Inertial navigation systems, perhaps. Just quickly, new, new, um, um, new hazards and behaviors. I'll just scoot through these. Wind farms, cracking things. We all know why they're important, but they do restrict the amount of water available for shipping. So they tend to funnel shipping further into the certain into lanes. And of course, as shipping is increasing, depth, all those things, as we're saying, more, more shipping in the same lane. AIS, um, this is a little example where tracks actually didn't exist. This was reported by one of our deep sea pilots. They were particularly concerned about a couple of tracks on AIS. And when you looked at the radar, they weren't there. Look out the window is still important, and use all means to ascertain um, that you can navigate safely. Um, Dover Straits, I'll skip, but just showing. The VARM, this is a grounding on the VARM just off of Dover. Um, we have a big light vessel there, but it didn't stop this guy. And you sort of wonder, I'm not sort of making any great assumption here, but you sort of wonder whether those, those purple arrows, which are just part of indicating the general direction of traffic flow for that, that particular area on a particular make of electronic chart system, whether they might have influenced the way the guy or girl planned their passage. But you do, and I'm just about to finish, you do get some very precise navigation. This was a ship that came out of the Thames, around there, this is an AIS track, and the colors show speed, so he speeded up, and then he suddenly slowed down into the blue and then speeded up again and his navigation was absolutely precise as he hit the East Goodwin light vessel. <laughs> I'll finish there. If you did need to wish to spend a little bit more time with us to understand the way we work, you can, of course, I'll just put in a pitch for Patricia Voyages. Um, we do take passengers who come with us, and uh, we can take up the 12 passengers, and um, we look after them well, and they see what we do. And they just go where the ship goes. Um, and we do have lighthouse cottages. If you're ever bored one day, have a look at rural retreats and look up lighthouse cottages and, and you could spend the weekend in one of those. They're fabulous. Thank you very much. It's still working. Well, we've been treated to a marvelous lecture, a real exposition. The only sad thing is, if you had a, a joy in pondering the mysteries of lights and lighthouses, that's now vanished for all time. But that's because we've had a most excellent lecture. Now, David, how long do we have for questions? Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> well, it was a very full lecture. I'm going to act as your chairman. First question there, please. A fascinating lecture. Um, I've worked in the railway industry. I was thinking of this low energy revolution, which is great. Um, if you're using a generator, two questions, three, well, three possibilities. The lighthouse could be connected to the national grid. The second possible, when you need power. Secondly, if you're going to do a generator, why not use gas? It's a lot cleaner than diesel. And the third possibility, if the building is listed, why you can't have a uh, solar array in a little car park next to the the building, which is hidden from the building, and then have it wired up to the building. That way you don't, you can have it correct angle for the sun, but you're not wrecking the aesthetic beauty of the building. That's the only question I have about it, really. The, um, 
and, and I think the truth, although bar one, we use a combination of those in reality. Where we do have a reliable main supply, we do use it. Um, we would still use that main supply primarily to, to charge batteries, so that then if that main supply fails, we've got five days' life of batteries um, to keep the lights working until our engineers can get there and put it right, or turn up with a portable generator to plug in, which they also sort of have that facility. So where we do have reliable main supply, we do, um, but some of them we just don't. You know, you don't. You're offshore or so remote that it's, it's just not viable. Um, we're looking at Beachy Head at the moment, which is connected via a very dubious umbilical cable to the crumbling cliff behind it. And, and that's one of ours that's on our risk register that we want to solarise as soon as possible. We do have some solar panels on it that were put there before um, it was listed. Um, but to put more on, on the, the lighthouse, we're going to have to, and we will, apply for a change to the listed building uh, consent to get approval to do that. Um, of course, it's all angles and, and you know, physical size and so on, so on to do that. Um, an interesting one on gas, actually an interesting question on gas. Uh, years ago, everything was gas when you know, the, the boys were gas powered. Um, you know, and we had endless, endless movements of boats shifting gas bottles onto the boys and so on. Um, we, we then went to standardise on diesel. And, and I think we're really in a position where we're saying we want to now go from, rather than go to gas, again, we want to go from diesel to solar and, and remove diesel and that sort of, that, that completely, a lot out or gas, to be honest. Thank you. John Buckingham at the back and then you, sir. Uh, thank you for excellent lecture. <clears throat> I'd like to know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how is the uh, technology for foghorns and uh, other audible uh, signals uh, changed over the years? The, um, um, yeah, I smile because we've been having an interesting experiment uh, last week on Mumble's Lighthouse uh, with a new, new version of a fog signal. Um, fog signals per se have been removed. However, they are now referred to as hazard warning signals rather than pure fog signals. Some of them are still bell. You'll find boys with bells on them still in some places. Um, and there is one, one lighthouse in, in Wales uh, which has got a bell on it rather than anything else. But generally they're now... where They have been reduced over the years, but you, you tend to find them on the ones that sort of... Uh, on a promontory that, that sticks out sort of quite notably from, from the rest of the coastline, so a sort of lone fisherman perhaps you know, would, would have an issue. Um, and now they're basically electric diaphragm type, type systems. And that you end up with a stack depending on, on the sort of range you need to achieve, plus some redundancy in case they fail. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'll add my thanks to the, to, to the splendid lecture. Please solve one small puzzle for me. Why do I see optics turning when the light is out? Um, we tend to keep them running. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that they're better con con to keep running than stop and start. They tend to just get, be more reliable if you, if you leave it running um, and, and rely on the two motors just to keep them going. So it avoids the stop-start. It takes a potential failure item out of, of stopping and starting. And say so the reliability of them is such that we can afford to keep them running. My two guesses were wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Is there another question? Yes, please. It's not so much a, not so much a, a question as a, I would like to confirm your opening statement of the view from the top of a rock pillar lighthouse. <coughs> I was fortunate enough to be involved in the electrification of the Bell Rock lighthouse, and I didn't. First thing I did when I got there was go straight up and walk round the light. And the view from up there is always fantastic. Uh, you made a pitch for the Patricia. Can I make one for the Ferris, which serves a similar purpose for the commissioners of Northern Lights? <laughs> <laughs> and there's 12 cabins for the 12 commissioners. Thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, mean, I, I think the, you're right. I mean, I, I, I was landed on Bishop Rock last year, and you, you sort of land on with a helicopter on the roof, um, climb down inside, the helicopter leaves you. And you just think, there's a number of feelings that go through. One, it's just an amazing place to be. But my goodness, that's isolation in a, in a way that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Any more questions? 
Right, I think it just uh, now required, sorry, to give a final round of thanks to our president for a wonderful lecture.